It was the death of the existing free software community that I was part of. During the 70s, I was using free software and developing free software, working at the Artificial Intelligence Lab at MIT, where we used an operating system, the Incompatible Time Sharing System, or ITS, that had been written by the system hackers of the lab, the team which I subsequently joined. And we treated it as free software. We shared any of it with anybody who wanted it. We occasionally got programs from other places. So we were all cooperating. And I learned to appreciate this way of life. But then the community collapsed after people in the lab founded two competing companies to make similar products. And not only that, but the PDP-10 computer, which ITS ran on and had been written for, became obsolete and it wouldn't run, the system wouldn't run on anything else. It was written in assembler language. So the community was gone and the software was effectively gone and this dropped me suddenly into the world of proprietary software, which I had learned to recognize as a world of nastiness, a world where people created obstacles for each other instead of cooperating with each other. So in moral terms, it was ugly. And I expected that my life would be totally miserable if I accepted that. So I decided to do everything within my power to escape from proprietary software. But that meant making a place to escape to. There was no way in 1983 to buy a modern computer and use it with free software. There wasn't sufficient free software in the world to do that. So my job was to develop that free software, either by writing it personally or by finding others to do so, so that we would have enough free software that we could use our computers with free software and reject proprietary software. Well, at the beginning, I didn't clearly separate in my own mind the two meanings of the word free. I didn't realize that for clear thinking you have to distinguish between gratis and freedom respecting or swatantra. But I learned that a few years later when I started giving speeches and explaining about this to people, I saw that it was necessary to make that distinction. And I also had to formulate more specific criteria for what counts as free. Now, I had such criteria in mind in the first uh, year or two because I was looking at existing licenses and deciding if they were adequate. But I hadn't written down and published such a definition, but I had to do so. And at first, there were three crucial freedoms. The freedom one was the freedom to study and change the source code. Freedom two was the freedom to study, sorry, to, well, actually, I often distinguish between the freedom to study the source code and the freedom to then uh, change it and the freedom to redistribute the program. That's how I formulated it at the beginning. Of course, freedom to redistribute really meant either with or without changing it. But in the 90s, there was a legal dispute which showed me that I had to be explicit about that. So after that, I said there was the freedom to study and change the source code, the freedom to distribute exact copies, and the freedom to distribute copies of your modified versions. Then I found out that one must explicitly insist on the freedom to run the program as you wish, because that can't be taken for granted. Until that time, I thought it could legally be taken for granted, given the other three freedoms. But then I found out that was not so, and therefore I added freedom zero, which is the freedom to run the program as you wish. And then in freedom one, in the 90s, I learned it was necessary to, ins <coughs> to insist on the freedom to actually use your modified version. If you study and change the source code, 
is that real practical freedom or is that purely theoretical freedom? That depends on whether you could actually put your modified version of the source code into use in the place you're running the program. And this became a practical distinction with the development of tyrant products, products that don't allow, that refuse to run the user's version of the software. They will only run the manufacturer's versions of the software. So if a program uh, says you can study and change the source code, but you can't actually run your version, then that's purely theoretical freedom, not practical freedom. And so since then I stated as the freedom to study and change the source code so that the program does your computing the way you wish, which implies that you can actually use your changed version. Uh, it's the difference between uh, gratis and libre. Yes. Sir. Or it's, uh, you know, I, de I don't, there is a, in Hindi, I believe, there is muft, which is zero price, yes. and then there it would be uh, maybe muktor uh, swatantra for free is in freedom. It's every time I say free, I'm talking about freedom. When I'm talking when I talk about price, I say grass. So to, to distribute it for free, that means grass, and therefore it's not what I'm talking about. Okay. I propose to develop a free encyclopedia with the same concept of free, what it, the free means you have the four freedoms. Okay. Now, that was an extension of a previous idea. Even in the 80s, even from the very beginning, I concluded that manuals for free software must be free. And the reason is the manual is really a part of the software distribution. And when you redistribute the program, you must be able to redistribute the manual with it. And when you change the program, well, if you're conscientious, you will correct the manual. So you must be free to change the manual. And that means the manual has to give you the same four freedoms that the program gives you. And so I began doing that as soon as I had any manuals. And in the late 80s, I wrote down the reasons why manuals for free software had to be free. But in the late 90s, I extended this to all works that are designed for use to do practical jobs. So a manual is a work meant for doing a practical job. You learn how to use the program or whatever thing it's a manual for. But there are other works that are designed for doing practical jobs. For instance, reference works, which are designed for looking things up. So encyclopedias must be free. And therefore I proposed an idea for how to develop a free encyclopedia, which was actually rather different from what Wikipedia does. What I proposed was that individuals would write and publish articles. And since they would be free, other people could publish their own modified versions of the articles that they had seen. So your version of this article might be here and my modified version of this same article might be there. And then the idea was once we had enough articles we would figure out some good way to index them. So Wikipedia does it in a very different way by letting people edit in a wiki, which means in effect that uh, They, that you can actually change their version. Whereas my idea was you, you would change your version and if I wanted to I would publish and be able to change my version of the same article. But then they would both be available in different places and maybe the encyclopedia would index them both. Well, I don't see the future. I always see the present and the past. 
but there are some flaws in Wikipedia now. Basically, it, when most people are wrong about something, Wikipedia will be wrong about it too. Or when most people don't want to admit certain kinds of thoughts, Wikipedia won't admit them. So it reflects in that way the culture it's embedded in. You can see this, for instance, in the tendency to refer to the GNU system as Linux, which is a mistake, but it's a widespread mistake. And there are people who fight passionately to make that mistake. And they seem to have mostly the upper hand in Wikipedia. And another common, another error that Wikipedia has in, inherited from the surrounding community is a tendency when writing about the history of computing to treat patents as more significant than inventions. So they have the attitude that an invention isn't real unless, it's pat unless there's a patent. In fact, they will talk about that somebody patented something rather than that he invented it, if he did. Uh, so what is the bias here? If it's the history of technology, then we should be more concerned with what was invented than with what was or wasn't patented. Even if both things occurred, something was invented and it was patented, why should we talk about the patenting rather than the invention? But they, they do. But they're just following a habit of writers of the history of technology who fell into this foolish prat pattern decades ago. I guess they thought, I mean, I don't know this, but I guess that they believed that since patents could be documented, that they were somehow better for proving history. Well, that, I guess the, the ability to study these uh, contemporary sources is of some use, for doing research into history. But what is significant in terms of the results of that research is what was invented, not what was patented. And if somebody didn't patent something, does that mean it didn't happen? Uh, you'll get that impression from a lot of writing about the history of technology. And the people who wrote about it for Wikipedia didn't think, didn't question this. So they just carried it over. There's no real way to prove it. A patent isn't proof either. Yes, okay. uh, because uh, patents have been obtained fraudulently. Uh, I read a book called The Telephone Gambit, which presents rather convincing evidence that Alexander Graham Bell obtained a patent on a telephone fraudulently with the help of a confederate in the patent office as well as other people who designed the whole scheme. He wasn't the ringleader of the scheme. He agreed to participate and be the front man, but it was other people who made the plot. Mobile phones as implemented now, I consider ethically unacceptable because they are surveillance and tracking devices. Imagine that I offered you something that would tell the state where you are at all times and enable the state to listen to you at any time. Would you like to carry such a device? But that's what a mobile phone is. Once I found out that they track the movements of the person carrying it, I said, I can't, I won't do a thing like that. No matter how convenient it is, I still won't. And then I found out that they can be remotely converted secretly into listening devices. That's possible because they contain malicious non-free software with a back door. Malicious features are quite common in non-free software. The most widely used non-free software packages have known malicious features. So this is an example of two of them, a surveillance feature and a backdoor. There are also malicious features that restrict the users, and many mobile phones have those also. 
And for me, the choice is clear. I choose freedom rather than having the uh, connectivity. And that applies to my computer as well. I will not connect to the internet through uh, systems that require me to identify myself. Thus, I will not connect to the internet in Changi Airport. A few years ago, I could do so. But then they set it up to make people identify themselves, and I just treat it as impossible. It's important to think about freedom so that you come to value freedom. And then you will see why you shouldn't take away other people's freedom.